God has a special plan for each and every one of us. One of the things I've been talking to you about in this series, that's my story, what's yours, is that God has a very special plan for each and every one of us. With that, I want to take just a couple of minutes to do a quick review. I want you to think about a couple of things that we've been talking about. We have uh, been, we shared the story of the man who had the legion or the demons in him. Remember, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, right? And what ended up happening there is that God gave, Jesus gave that man permission after he cast out the demons out of this guy. And we're going to, I tell you what, we're going to read that verse here in a few minutes. I'm not going to do that just yet, but in a few minutes, I'm going to read that verse with you. So you get a little better scope of that. But he had given this man permission to do something very special. Then we talked about the story of a lady, uh, the woman at the well. And that's one of the reasons why I want to show you the video as well, because the woman at the well was also given a, a commission to do something and been given permission to do something as well. We're going to read a passage out of that um, portion of Scripture as well in just a few moments. Before we do that, though, here we're seeing in these two stories there is an underlying theme that's happening, and it's called permission. God is giving permission to do some amazing things. I want you to think about this with me, if you would, for just a moment. As a teacher gives permission to a student to go outside of the classroom, in order to represent her, for whatever reason she might do that, one must have a what? A hall pass, right? That's permission. You remember the hall pass? Those of you that went to school, some of you that go to school today, I guess they still give hall passes maybe. They probably don't let you out of the classroom nearly as much. Uh, but you had to have a hall pass to get through the hall. And it was a special permission that you were given. Now don't miss this, because I think so many times we get the attitude where God gives us permission to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ, but we look at it from a perspective like, oh yeah, it's a permission, God lets everybody, blah, 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 blah. Yet if you're in a classroom and a teacher hands you a, a hall pass and gives you permission to do something, you understand the power of the hall pass. You understand that it's more than just a general attitude of permission. But how sad would it be if, after being handed the hall pass, the student was to return back to their seat, feeling empowered with the hall pass, the permission to do something, and yet doing absolutely nothing with it. Because when the teacher said, I need someone to represent me, you know, used to in the day, they don't do this anymore. Everything's electronic and all that kind of thing. But in the day, they would take attendance or whatever, and they would need somebody to take the attendance card down to the office. You remember those days, those that are a little older, right? You remember those days? Everybody, when the teacher said, I need somebody to take, boy, every hand in the room, boom, everybody went out of the room. They wanted the hall pass. They wanted the permission to go. And so how sad it would be if the teacher gave permission and that person went back to their desk and just sat down. You'd be sitting there going, what? <laughs> I mean, let me go. Why are you not going? Why are you not taking up on the hall pass? But I want you to know that Jesus has empowered us with a hall pass, with permission to go into the world and to point others to him. He's commissioned us to go. He's empowered us by his authority to go. How sad it is after being given a hall pass if to only return back to our seat and do absolutely nothing with the authority God's given us. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 8 and verse number 38 and 39. We're just going to, again, highlight a few passages here and I'm going to move along real quick. So you got to listen fast because I'm going to be talking fast. We'll have uh, the scripture up on our, on our screen. So if you don't have a Bible with you, you can look there. But if you have a Bible, I always want to encourage you to open the Word of God. Get familiar with the Word of God. I don't care if you use an iPad, an iPod, your iPhone, or some other device that may have your scriptures on there. Uh, that's fine. 
All right? But if you would, let's follow along. It says in Luke chapter 8, verse 38 and 39, it says, The men from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, and Jesus sent him away. This man who had the demons said, Jesus, let me go with you on the boat. I want to follow you. And Jesus, he sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Isn't that powerful? Jesus had commissioned this man to go back home and to share the good news. And what he ended up sharing, and by the way, what was the good news? All right, the good news, yes, in general, is Jesus Christ. The good news is about his death, burial, and resurrection. But more than just his death, burial, and resurrection, and also, and I don't ever want to leave this out anymore when I talk about the price Jesus paid on the cross, is not only the death, but also that his father had forsook him, that he was buried, and he rose again the third day. That was the full payment of sin. And that's a great story, and that's some good news. But more than just that news in and of itself, I want you to know this, that Jesus Christ wants to have a personal relationship with you. And that's more than just the death, burial, and resurrection and the father forsaking his son on the cross. That's awesome, but you have to incorporate it with the fact that Jesus wants a personal relationship with you. So then we also looked at John chapter 4, verse 39 through 42, where we hear about the Samaritan woman. Listen to the verse, and you can follow along. It says, Many Samaritans from that town believed in him, talking about Jesus, because of the woman's, what's that word? Because of the woman's, what's on the screen? Because of her testimony. Today we listen to the testimonies of those that are here. But it says, and they believed because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did was her testimony. So when the Samaritans came to him, to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. That's powerful. Because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that, that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. I don't want you to miss this this morning. We can share our testimony, and that's powerful. But at the end of the day, the only thing that will change a person's life is when they encounter Jesus. More than just our story, they have to encounter the power and the working power of Jesus, the saving power of Jesus. I gave this to you a few weeks back, a couple weeks back, and if you didn't get to write it down, I want to encourage you to do it now. Your testimony or your witness is the window of God's truth and grace. We want other people to see Jesus, and yet Jesus tells us to go and to tell the good news. The good news being what Jesus has done in our life and what, how Jesus has met our personal needs, and how that Jesus is our life, and how that we have a relationship now with Jesus because of Jesus. And it's more than just hearing about Jesus, it's you telling about Jesus and who he is. You know, believe it or not, I've heard many people say that their relationship with Jesus, well, <laughs> It's a personal matter. You ever hear anybody say that? I've heard people say that to me. It's a personal matter, preacher. They say, you know, it's no one else's business but my own because it's between me and God. That's what I've heard people say. But I want you to know that's not biblical. 
but rather that is careless and wasteful to the authority that God has given to each and every one of us to represent him in this world. God has given us a hall pass. He's given us permission to go and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And when we take that hall pass and stick in our pocket, oh, it's a personal thing. It's between me and God. This is nobody else's business. Then you are wasting the authority that God has given to you to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, the very last thing Jesus told his disciples were to go. But not only was he telling his disciples to go, he was telling all of us. Matter of fact, you can write this down. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. Listen to what it says. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Not because God is gonna condemn them, but Jesus said, I came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through my, me might be saved. And the reason he said that was because he said, I don't come into the world to condemn, the world's already condemned. So listen, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are already condemned before God. God doesn't have to condemn you. Your sin condemns you. People say, well, why does God, if God be God and God's a God of love, why does he cause this to happen and that happen and these bad things to take place? Listen, those things don't take place because God makes them happen. Those things happen because of the effects of what sin coming into the world has done to shake our world for what we've known it. Sin is brutal. But Jesus has come in order that we might be set free from the penalty of of sin. Now again, I want to have a little bit of review with you for just a moment because what is sin? All right, don't miss this because it's, it really boils down to one thing, sin. Sin, remember the bowl of fruit I had a few weeks back and I showed you that this bowl of fruit can represent lust and pride and anger and and all these different elements can be in this bowl and we can say this is sin, but really this is only the fruit of sin. That fruit comes from something much deeper. The fruit is known by its root. Listen to me this morning. The root of sin is not being submitted to God and surrendered to him. When we're not submitted and surrendered to God, that is sin. Any time a person is living their life apart from being surrendered and submitted to God, they're living in sin. And they could even be coming to church every week. It doesn't matter because it's not about going to church. It's about being submitted to God. You say, well, pastor, you know, I thought people that are living sinless life come to church. I will say that people who, who seek to live for the Lord desire to come to church they desire to be there some are able to do it more than others but I can simply say this that it's just like going to McDonald's you can go to McDonald's and just because you walk into McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger does it but guess what you're going to find at McDonald's you're going to find hamburgers because they have hamburgers at McDonald's but that doesn't mean just because you walk in there you're a hamburger not everybody that comes to church is a follower of Jesus I want you to understand this morning that God has a desire for each and every one of us to live a sinless life. And you say, well, that's impossible. You know, I get angry all the time. I've got things that go on in my life. I get that. Those fruits of sin are in your life and they're in mine too. But I want to tell you what minimizes the fruit of sin in my life. It's my submission and surrendering to God every day to walk with him. 
So when I had those buds of sin that began to pop out on the limbs of my life, I realize it, and I realize that's just a something that shows me that I'm not being submitted and to surrender to God, and I need to stop and ask God to cleanse me because if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from my lack of submission to him every time. Isn't that awesome? We can focus on so many things, but what we need to focus on is what does our relationship with Jesus look like? What does that submission to him look like? And so we go and we preach the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world that Jesus wants to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us. Similar to a middle school or high school teacher or possibly even a a college teacher, you may have had a person in your life, an authority figure like that, that, that you have had great respect for and that was one of your favorites. How many of you had a favorite teacher? Middle school, high school, or college, you had a favorite teacher? Raise your hand high. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, in a room, there's quite a few hands. We all seem to have somebody that was our favorite. That teacher seemed to really connect with you, no doubt. And you respected them because of their concern for you. And not just because of their authority, even though they should have respect because of the authority that they have in your life. But you honestly had nothing but good to say about that person to everyone around you. How much that teacher really has meant to you. And that possibly even stirred up some some jealousy amongst other people in their heart because they didn't have that same teacher. But they wished they did. You know, Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. Yet it is more than that. It is because of his personal concern for us that he has given us hope and life. Please don't miss this this morning. If you miss anything I say as I wrap this up this morning is that the reason we should go and tell other people about Jesus is because Jesus loves you and is concerned about you. And it should be. Listen, I realize I'm speaking Greek to some of you right now. When I say have a personal relationship with Jesus, that is qualified in your mind. It's simply, well, I did my time at church. I gave my time. They can't say anything to me. I was there. And your relationship with Jesus doesn't hold any more than just coming to church on a Sunday morning, feeling like you can notch your belt and say you've done your deed for the week. But it's not about that at all. Having a relationship with Jesus is about communicating with Jesus all day long and having your mind set on him, keeping everything submitted and surrendered to God. I can't be a good husband, but Jesus can be a good husband in and through me. I can't be a good father, but as I surrender my ability to be a father to my children, I can be the best father because of Jesus as I surrender and submit to him. I can't be a good neighbor, a good pastor, a good friend, without consciously surrendering myself under the authority and the love and the concern that Jesus has for me. And then you know what that makes me want to do? It makes me want to get up every Sunday morning and come and share with you what Jesus wants to do in your life and how he wants to pour life into you and purpose into you. And to have you to be excited about that relationship. So excited that you want to go and tell everybody, just like your special teacher you had, where you are excited to share that. Jesus is one that is closer than, a, than anybody. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And the scripture tells us that we have the permission to go and to share him with others. That's powerful. So what's your story? What are you doing to share your story with others? I don't mean, yeah, I went to church and I heard sermons and yeah, finally, I know, God was cranking it on me and so I, I said, okay, you know, if that's what everybody expects and if that's the only way to get to heaven, I, I'm willing to sign up for a boring life. 
yeah, that would be a boring life if that's your, if that's your thing. <laughs> I can just tell you this. When my wife and I met, we fell into this liking mode of one another and, and a relationship began to kindle between the two of us. And I wanted everybody to know about it because she cared for me. And it's exciting. And it came with people going, oh yeah, I don't want to have anything to do with John anymore. And different people saying that. No doubt Betty lost friends as well because, you know, you're kind of off the market. Her, not me, all right, I understand that. But you find yourself in that place where when somebody really cares about you, you want to tell everybody. And listen, it's not, all right, well, I have to. I guess if God says I need to go tell people about him, you know that is a sign that there's a real problem in your personal relationship with Jesus. Listen to me, I'm just going to say it for the way it is. There is a problem in our relationship with Jesus when we are not wanting to share him with other people. I get excited about what I have and what I value. I get excited about it. And when I don't value it, I'm not going to be excited about it. And I want you to know this morning, we ought to value Jesus and understand who he is and how he's impacted our life in such a way that he's made a difference. And listen, I want to say something this morning, and I don't, if you take it wrong, I'm sorry. I love people, but I don't do this for you. I love you. And I appreciate you. But at the end of the day, I don't care if you listen to what I have to say. Because what I have to say this morning is that Jesus is everything. And if you're not willing to listen to that, that's more your issue than mine. Jesus is everything. And I don't get up here and say these things this morning or any other time in my life because I'm looking to be accepted by anybody because I'm not up here for you. I'm up here for Jesus. And I want you to know this morning that you've got to get that determination that it's not, well, you know what, if I tell them they might reject me or deny me or not want to have anything more to do with me. Listen, then who are you living your life for? Apparently for other people. How about we live it for Jesus? And we just say, you know what? I love him so much. Yes, there's going to be some people that aren't going to listen to what I have to say. So what? I'm not doing it for them. I want to do it because I love Jesus and he means that much to me. He's filled my cup that it overflows and it just pours out on other people. I can't help that. It doesn't mean I have to be rude or obnoxious or mean, but it does mean that I have got to be so determined that I'm going to live for Jesus regardless if anybody else follows. All I want to do is go and point people to Jesus. What I've come to find out in that, what I've come to find out, hold on just a minute, what I've come to find out about that is when we have that heart and that mind and that attitude, trust me, over the course of time, as we pray for people and we're sharing, people are going to follow. Amen. They're going to come, yeah. right? And you got to claim it in the name of Jesus. And you got to be willing to lay down before Jesus at his throne in prayer and pour your heart out to God and pray for people, but then be confident to go and to share, not because they're going to receive, but because you love Jesus. Yeah. That's what it should be about. Sharing our life, our heart, our passion, our concern. Knowing that there's no other reason but for Jesus. So you can write this thought down. Jesus is personal, yet meant to be public. Jesus is personal, yet meant to be public. Yes, it is a personal thing. But the more personal it becomes, the more public I'm going to make it. The less personal it is, the less public I'm going to let it be known. Because I'm not going to talk about something I don't really have or don't really know. Jesus is personal, yet meant to be public. What does that look like in your life? That's what we all want in our life. 
every one of us. And that's what we all have need of is a connection, a hope, a purpose. And God has wired us that way and Jesus is the only one, the only one who can truly satisfy that need in our life. He's the only one. We can search after riches and possessions and, and all kinds of purpose in our life. We can go try to find the best job in the world, but at the end of the day, only Jesus satisfies. Only Jesus satisfies. With every head bowed and every eye closed.